Hey everyone, we are going to start a chapter on the electronic structure of atoms. And this is going to be a longer series of videos that covers a number of topics that eventually will lead to an explanation about why we see the periodic table and why it's organized the way it is. We're going to get started talking a little bit more about physics topics and eventually we'll get on to the idea of electrons and how how electrons are arranged in atoms. The playlist in this series of videos is going to be called the electronic structure of atoms and so make sure that you work through each of the videos in the playlist. Now I'm going to start by introducing the idea. At the end of the 19th century, so beginning of 20th century, at that point they believed that they had two sets of equations. One is Newton's equations and the other one is Maxwell's equations and that by understanding these two equations they're able to make predictions and explain the behavior of the universe. And the universe at that point specifically was viewed as being composed of two different types of systems. So one is matter, which is anything that has a mass. And then the second is waves, which are things that don't have masses but have energy. In fact, a physics publication at the time says that future physicists really didn't have any more jobs to do because everything that existed could already be explained by these two theories. What a shocker they found later on that there is a number of experiments done around the time that could not be explained by either one of these theories. And of course, during that first 20 years of the 20th century is when there was a lot of development of physics that helped explain the behavior of these new set of experiments. We're going to talk about how these explanations, which are called quantum mechanics, is going to help us understand how subatomic particles are arranged in the atoms, specifically the electron, because that's really the particle that's going to be important in chemical reactions. And we also will use that explanation to help us understand the structure of the atom and explain why our elements arrange the way they are in the periodic table. There's a couple of series of YouTube videos if you're interested in watching that you can look at but uh, I will get on here and it all starts with understanding the idea of waves and electromagnetic radiation. Electromagnetic radiation or light is a form of the way energy can be transferred through vacuum. Other methods of energy transfer usually requires it to go through through some kind of matter, but electromagnetic radiation is a form of energy transfer that can go through vacuum. Electromagnetic wave consists of two types of fields, electric and magnetic fields. So the way we often visualize this is that there's two different waves that make up light. So if your light is traveling in this particular path, direction of travel, that that light beam actually has two components to it. There's the electric component and then there is the magnetic component. So the light can be affected by both electric fields as well as magnetic fields. So a wave is disturbance that transmit energy through space or material or medium. Now of course you sort of understand this that if I were to tie one end of this to say a door or a fixed point of some kind and I start moving this rope up and down it would generate this motion of up and down along the rope and that's what we refer to as a wave. That's how we model a wave. Mathematically this would be represented by a sine or cosine function and that's exactly how you would see this in physics. So what are the components of, of a wave? The peaks and the troughs make up the wave itself. So if you have a peak here and then you go to another peak, that whole one peak and one trough is what we refer to as one wave. There are two parts of a wave that's going to be really relevant in our discussion. So the wavelength is distance from the beginning of the wave to the end of a wave. An easy way to see this if you have two peaks, that's one wavelength, or if you have two troughs, that's also one wavelength. And wavelength has a symbol lambda, Greek letter lambda. So frequency is how many waves pass through a particular point in space at a given unit of time, usually a second. So here's a picture that shows different waves with different frequencies. So the more waves pass through that same distance, right, in one second, we would say that has a higher frequency, and then this would be a lower frequency wave. Now you can see that wavelength and frequency actually have an inverse relationship 
relationship. This wave here has a longer wavelength, but it has fewer frequency. And this wave here has a shorter wavelength, it has more frequency. So there's an inverse relationship between wavelength and frequency. And in fact, when you multiply wavelength and frequency, you get a third component of the wave, which is the speed of the wave. Now, for electromagnetic waves, what's going to be important is that because these electromagnetic radiation can have many different frequency and therefore can have many different wavelengths, we typically list the spectrum or the range of electromagnetic radiation based on both wavelength and frequency. So here we have all of these being electromagnetic radiation going from really, really short wavelengths to really, really long wavelengths and vice versa. The frequency here is the opposite. It's going from very high frequency on this side to very low frequency on that side. Visible light, which is the light that we can actually see with our eyes, is a very small portion of this electromagnetic spectrum. In fact, this range is only from roughly about 400 to 750 nanometer, going from our familiar rainbow color, Roy G. Biff, right? red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, and violet. So that's the visible light, which is the part that we can see, but there's actually all these other lights that we can't really see with our eyes. We can see it with other instruments. These electromagnetic radiation can travel in vacuum at the same speed. That speed has a symbol C, and it has a speed of about 3 times 10 to the 8th. Now you can have more significant figures here and that number will change, but we usually use these numbers in calculation. 3 times 10 to the 8th meters per second. If you put light through air, then it's going to slow down a little bit because there's air particles that interact with the energy of light. If you put it in water, it's going to slow down even more. There's this equation that's going to be really convenient for us to use because remember I said earlier that speed is equal to wavelength times frequency. So here we can use that for the all light waves, uh, which is the one shown right here in this spectrum. For all light waves, the speed of light is going to be equal to lambda times frequency. And frequency is the symbol nu, which looks like a V, but it's actually the Greek letter nu. So let's take a look at this problem where we need to do a conversion between wavelength and frequency for electromagnetic radiation or light. The problem comes from your notes. It talks about a dental hygienist using x-ray, which has a certain wavelength, listening to a radio station with another wavelength and looking at the blue sky, which has a third wavelength. And the question is, what's the frequency for each of those electromagnetic radiation? The key here is to use our standard uh, equation that relates speed of light with wavelength and frequency, which is C equals lambda nu. And in this case, we're trying to solve for frequency. So frequency is going to be equal to C over lambda. And once you have that, it's just a matter of calculating it for each of the given wavelength. Keep in mind, though, that the unit of the speed of light is meters per second. So that means all your wavelengths have to be expressed in meter in order for the units to cancel out correctly. So you just want to make sure that when you write your wavelength, you convert them back to meter. And I think the easiest way to do this is to just write the prefix as whatever the exponent is. So in this case, if we have 100 picometer, for example, it will just be 100 times 10 to the minus 12 meter. And then you'll get your answer here as 3 times 10 to the 18 hertz. And if you do it for the other two, radio will give you a frequency of 9.2 times 10 to the uh, 7 hertz, which, of course, if you convert that, that, you will see that that ends up being 92 megahertz, which it's uh, a frequency in your radio station. Usually it starts from about 88 and it goes all the way to 108 or 109 or so. So the sky in this case has a much higher frequency at 6.34 times 10 to the 14 hertz. So one of the most important ideas to get across is that at the end of the 19th century and the beginning of 20th century, the most advanced physics theories at the time held that the universe is composed of two different types of things, which is energy and matter. So energy, another way to say that is that those are waves, right? Things that travel as waves. And matter are things that comes in chunks, right? Particles, things you can actually hold, whereas energy you can't. You can change the quantity of matter, of course, piece by piece. You can, for example, example, if you have a sample of gold, you can cut it to smaller pieces. And energy, on the other hand, is massless. It doesn't really have that property that you can cut it or you can chunk it out. Now, 
one of the most important characteristics of waves that we will see later on is this idea of a diffraction. So imagine that this is water that's going through a wall. And in the wall, there's a couple of holes that allows that water to pass through. Interestingly, what happens is that when the water passes through those two holes, it's actually going to generate further smaller waves here. And each of those smaller waves can then do what we call wave interference with each other. And wave interference is basically this idea that two waves can combine together if they are in phase, which means that the peak of one wave is aligned with the peak of the other wave. And when they do that, then they form a larger wave. The other side of interference is they can also do something we call destructive interference, which is when the peak of one wave is matched up exactly with the trough of the second wave. When that happens, then the resulting wave is exactly zero. So it has no amplitude. And so when you combine all that patterns together, all you see, if this happens to be light, for example, you're going to see patterns of darkness and brightness and darkness and brightness just being interspersed like this because some parts of this is going to have constructive interference and the other side of it is going to have destructive interference. You see this happening also with sound waves. If you're in a stadium or a room where the acoustic is not that great, in certain parts of that room you might not hear as well as you are in other parts of the room. Now what's interesting of course is that particles don't behave this way, right? So if we go back to that example again, so if I on the other side of the wall start throwing a bunch of marbles across, some of the marbles are just going to be blocked by the wall and some of the marbles are going to pass through. But those marbles that pass through, assuming I throw it hard enough, would just go in that straight direction and hit it right here. So these marbles are not going to all of a sudden generate a bunch of patterns, which is exactly what we see when we have water waves. We see these patterns, whereas with marbles, if we have those two holes, we're just going to see two patterns right here corresponding to when the marble hits the wall on this side. So that's really one of the observations that later on we need to explain when we're talking about the electron. It's the difference between the behavior of a particle and a weight.